we want to look at we want to look at pastoral poetry pastoral poetry pastoral poetry refers to a type of poetry pastoral poetry refers to a type of poetry that depicts shepherds in natural environment pastoral poetry depicts shepherds in natural environment pastoral poetry depicts the humble lives of shepherds in natural environment so in understanding pastoral poetry you need to understand character and space you need to understand characterization and space it is important for you to take note of the spe uh, speciality of the poetry and its characterization. That's how you understand pastoral poetry. You take note of its speciality and its characterization. The, sp the speciality is a natural environment. The space is a natural environment. The space is the countryside, the rural area. The village setting. That's a village setting. And the characterization is mostly shepherds who are called pastors. Pastors because they take care of the sheep. Their primary duty is to take care of the sheep. So this is the reason in church you are the sheep and the, and the pastor is the shepherd, the good shepherd. And on Sundays they take you to the pasture which is the word of God. So that's where the idea comes from. So it should be noted that the that the natural environment is idyllic. So the environment is idyllic. It is always depicted in an ideal state. As a perfect place for man to be, full of peace, serenity, and tranquility. It is full of peace, serenity, and tranquility. And this usually this is usually contrasted. This is usually contrasted with the city space, the urban center. This is usually contrasted with the city space or the urban center. 
which is full of noise, violence, crime, and all forms of un actions that unsettle the peace of the human soul. So the rural setting is where you go to find peace, away from the noise and the pollution in the city. And sometimes this contrast is usually ideologically driven and morally constrained. It should be noted that it is interesting to note that writers who wrote pastoral poetry did not live in the rural areas, did not live in the countryside. It should be noted that writers who wrote pastoral poetry did not live in the countryside. They actually lived in the cities. And they wrote pastoral poetry as a way of coping with the, with the noise pollution in the city. They wrote pastoral poetry as a way of coping with the noise pollution in the city, the violence in the city. In contrast with the, or in contrast to the peace that one could find, the rural area, which either is so far away or has been destroyed in the cause, has been destroyed in the cause of building the city or the urban center. So that the pastoral poetry itself becomes an act of expressing the poet's nostalgia for the rural space, for the countryside that he can no longer have. An act of expressing nostalgia for the nostalgia for the it's a loin for it's a loin for so something that nostalgia loin for the rural setting that they can no longer have probably because it has been destroyed in the course of building the urban center in which they now stay or because the rural area is so far removed that they cannot experience its peace and tranquility. So you should note that the pastoral poetry was practiced as a way of coping with the loss or the absence of the rural areas, usually associated with peace and tranquility. Pastoral poetry was practiced in Renaissance England. Pastoral poetry was practiced in Elizabethan England. But its origins do go back to the classical period. And of course, you must understand that the Elizabethans modeled their art forms from the ancients or the classical writers. They modeled their art forms from the ancients or the classical writers. And so, it explains why they had to borrow the form from the ancients. So the two prominent writers from the classical era who practiced who practiced pastoral poetry are, are Theocritus and Virgil. Are Theocritus 
and Virgil. Theocritus practiced the bucolics, which is in the Greek tradition. Theocritus practiced the bucolics, which is in the Greek tradition. And Virgil practiced the eclogues, the eclogues, which is in the Roman tradition. The Theocritus, the bucolics. Virgil, the clause. The clause. Those are terms that refer to pastoral poetry in the Greek and Roman traditions, respectively. The bucolics and the clogs are terms that refer to pastoral poetry in the Greek and Roman traditions, respectively. So, we can trace the origins of the pastoral poetry to the bucolics and the clogs of Theocritus and Virgil. It should be noted that even in the classical period, writers were known to begin their poetry career by writing the pastoral because it was considered a humble art form. Because it was considered a humble art form. And so the artist needed to start small to show his humility. The artist needed to start small to show his humility. All right? And we ask people not to despise their small beginnings. Because those who start small are very likely to be great. Okay? And so after they have done that, they will then go on to write the epic, which is the apex of the poetry art form. After writing the pastoral and mastering it, they will then be promoted by the muse to write the epic, which is an enviable and the apex of the poetic art form. And indeed, the pastoral as an art form could be contrasted with the epic form, all right, in the fact that there are different in style and techniques, a different in style and techniques. The epic can be contrasted with the pastoral poetry in terms of length. The epic can be contrasted with pastoral poetry in terms of length. Because the epic is well longer, well lengthier than the pastoral poetry. The epic is way longer, way lengthier than the pastoral poetry. And the epic uses grand style because it talks about highly pledged members of society and their heroic deeds, whereas the pastoral talks about people of lower class as stratum, people of lower class position in society, and so has to use the language of commons simpler language. So you can see the difference. The pastoral is set often in a rustic environment. 
in the bush, idealized as the best place to be, as the epic is set in urban centers, centers of culture and civilization. The epic contains great actions of great men, especially war heroes, whereas the pastoral contains the simple, commonplace, everyday activities of common people, like taking care of sheep. So you can see the contrast. The world, the epic usually has a universal dimension. The epic usually has a universal dimension because it, it, the events that it depicts usually universal. That means it affects a good part of the universe. Whereas the pastoral is provincial. The epic is cosmopolitan and metropolitan, in which, in setting and rich, the pastoral is provincial. All right, to exemplify Renaissance or Elizabethan epic, we will discuss two poems. To exemplify, to exemplify Renaissance or Elizabethan ep um, pastoral poetry, we will discuss two poems, not epic, pastoral poetry. We will discuss two poems, and the poems are The Passionate Shepherd to His Love by Christopher Marlowe, and The Names Reply to the Shepherd by Sir Walter Raleigh. So on the course outline, we'll discuss The Passionate Shepherd to His Love by Christopher Marlowe, the Passionate Shepherd to His Love by Christopher Marlowe and Sir Walter Raleigh's The Names Reply to the Shepherd. First, we start with The Passionate Shepherd to His Love by Christopher Marlowe. Christopher Marlowe's birth date is not known. Christopher Marlowe's birth date is not known. But we know that he was baptized on the 26th of February, 1564. So you can count like seven days back to determine the, the birth date because people were bound to be baptized within seven days of their birth. Was baptized on the 26th of February 1564. He died on 30th May 1593. It's a very young age. Died on the 30th of May 1593. Christopher Marlowe was an English poet. Playwright and translator. He is the most famous Elizabethan playwright. Repeated as the most famous Elizabethan playwright, especially with his play Tambling. 
usually we display tumbling. His plays also influenced William, William Shakespeare as they were contemporaries. His plays also influenced William Shakespeare as they were contemporaries. He wrote mostly in blank verse. He wrote mostly in blank verse, which Shakespeare imitated. His famous works are Hero and Lenda. Hero and Lenda. And Lenda. Tumbling the Great. Tumbling the Great. Edward the Second. That's on the line title of text, with our text, and Dr. Faustus. And Dr. Faustus. Mallow died in controversial circumstances in 1593. Mallow died in controversial circumstances in 1593. He was said to be have been a spy for the Elizabethan government. He was rumored to have been a spy for the government and was killed in a, a tavern. In a tavern. It's really where lowly people go to drink. A tavern. That's where lowly people go to drink, have a drink. He was stopped, I suppose, after a quarrel. But he left us quality literary works. To read and remember him by. He left us quality literary works to read and remember him by. And one of them is this pastoral poem entitled The Passionate Shepherd Trislam. In reading the poem, we will pay attention to the principles of pastoral poetry, namely the depiction of the lives of a shepherd, the depiction of the natural environment in its ideal state, the portrayal of love as a, a major theme, or the depiction of the love life of the shepherd, which is the dominant theme of this particular poem, among other principles. So the passionate shepherd to his love is organized in six stanzas. Is organized in six stanzas. And each stanza is made up of four lines. The passionate shepherd to his love is organized in six stanzas. And each stanza is made up of four lines, meaning that the poem is written in quatrains. The poem is written in what? 
quatrain. Ok? The poem does not only have meter, it also has a rhyme scheme. The poem does not only have meter, it also has a rhyme scheme. The rhyme scheme of the poem is A A B B. A A B B. A A B B. So the rhyme scheme of the poem is A A B B. So the first line of the poem says, Come live with me and be my love and we will all the pleasures prove that valleys groves hills and fields Woods or steepy mountain hills. So that's the first stanza of the poem. So you could see the rhyme scheme A A B B A A B B. All right. So. The first stanza reads, Come live with me and be my love, and we will all the pleasures prove. The valleys, groves, hills, and fields, woods, or steepy mountain hills. Okay, so we have determined the rhyme scheme. The poem, we are now to determine the meter. The poem is written in in iambic tetrameter. Okay. This is on stress, stress, on stress, stress, on stress, stress, on stress, stress. Okay. This is on stress, stress, on stress, stress, on stress, stress, on stress, stress. Unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed. Sorry. Um, the valleys, groves, hills, and plains. So let's see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Maybe this is a syllable, so we give it a syllable. Um, so that on stress, stress, 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 on stress, stress. No. Woods or CP. Mountain hills. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's a problem. Two. There's a problem with the syllable. But it's supposed to be uniform. But what we notice is that. We have unstressed stress, right? So this is unstressed stress. Unstressed is I am. All right? So it happens four times one, two, three, four. That makes it a parameter. 
That makes it a trimeter. It's the same thing. Maybe they have a way of pronouncing one of the words with the extra syllable at that time. Okay, so let's do it, but it's written in iambic tetrameter. Okay, so we we'll read the entire poem now and do the analysis. Come live with me and be my love, and we will all the pleasures prove the valleys, groves, hills, and fields, woods or steepy mountain hills. Second stanza, and we will sit upon the rocks, seeing the shepherds feed their flock by shallow rivers to whose falls melodious birds sing madrigals. And I will make thee beds of roses, and I will make thee beds of roses, and a thousand fragrant poses, a cup of flowers, and a kettle embroidered with. with Embroidered all with leaves of metal. A gown made of the finest wool, which from our pretty lamps we pull. Fair lined slippers for the cold, with buckles of the purest gold. A belt of straw and ivy bats, with coral clubs and amber stats. And if these pleasures may the move, come live with me and be my love. The shepherds swan shall dance and sing for thy delight each May morning. If this delight thy mind may move, then live with me and be my love. So in this poem, in this poem, the persona, the persona is a shepherd from all indications. The persona of the poem is a shepherd. And he is the only voice speaking in the poem. The persona is a shepherd. He happens to be the only voice speaking throughout the poem. Because at the end of the day, the lady does not respond. We don't know the lady's response. All we know that is that this shepherd probably has gone to town and has met a city lady. The lady has never been to the countryside and he is trying to woo her, to take her back to the rural area, to the countryside. And so the whole poem is the whole poem is a, the text of the shepherd's attempt to woo the lady and make her accept uh, uh, his love proposal. In the course of wooing the lady, he makes a lot of promises, which we hope he will keep. In an attempt to make the lady accept the proposal. So you could see that in the poem, the expression come live with me, come live with me and be my love is a kind of refrain. Kind of refrain in the poem. Or a repetent. It's a repetent in the poem in the form of a refrain. Repetent in poetry is a word that is a word or expression that is repeated in the poem. It is a ref, is a it's a refrain if the repetition is consistent. All right. So you can take the word "come live with me," with mean, my love as a repetent in the poem. And it's a refrain. Which is what the, uh, the shepherd wants the lady to do to leave the city and come to the village. You know, it's, an, it's a difficult task to convince a city lady to leave the city and go to the rural area, which explains why the shepherd has to go to great lengths to make promises. 
and tell her how they are going to enjoy uh, in the countryside and how enjoyment in the countryside is different from the one in the city. All right? So come live with me and be my love, and we will all the pleasures proof. So when she uh, goes, accepts his proposal and goes to live with him, they are bound to enjoy themselves, pleasures proof. Okay? And this pleasure is linked to the idyllic state of the environment, which we find in the, the remaining two lines of the stanza. The valleys grooves, hills and fields, all right, woods or steepy mountain hills. All the pleasures that we can, you can get from the natural environment will be yours if you come to live with me, all right, in the village. You could see that there is a different kind of pleasure in the village, all right, in the countryside. You get it. All right, and so from the beginning, we see that the dominant imagery in this poem is visual imagery. All right, and visual imagery is evoked in words like valleys, because they make you see the beauty of the natural environment. Remember, in pastoral poetry, the natural environment is depicted in its ideal state, in its perfect state. Okay, so you could see valleys, groups, because these words are performative as they speak, you see them with your mind's eyes. Since the, since the visual. So you see valleys, you see groves, you see hills, you see fields. So you can imagine how beautiful the, the countryside is. And he is trying to entice her with the beauty of the natural environment compared to the noise and the chaos that exists in the city. Woods, steepy mountains that they will climb. All right, every day. <laughs> All right. Okay. Then in stanza, in, in stanza two, he continues, says, "And we will sit upon the rocks, sing the shepherds feed their flocks, by shallow rivers to whose falls melodious birds sing madrigals." This is another promise. When we go to the countryside. All right. All we will do all day is to sit on the rocks and and rocks and watch the shepherds feeding their flocks. All right. After all, in the village there are no cinemas, no shopping malls. All right. So what we have here is just to enjoy the beauty of the natural environment. Okay. You see shepherds feeding their flocks. It's a it's a beautiful sight to behold. Right. So again, you have the depiction of the visual imagery there in seeing the shepherds feed their flock. And then we have visual imagery was like shallow rivers. All right? And then we, in, in this standard, we also have another dimension of the natural environment. It's beautiful, seeing the birds flying in the sky and seeing melodious songs that we call madrigals. Okay? So this is what the shepherd promised to the lady. In the first stanza, he says, And I will make thee beds of roses, and a thousand fragrant poses. Okay, so this is the promise that he makes. Okay. Uh, the bed of roses there might be a metaphor for easy life. Your life will be easy in the villages. Okay. Um, or be full of love. Okay, there's also a bit of exaggeration uh, in, in, um, in the second line of the third stanza, which is hyperbole, when it says, and a thousand fragrant poses. Poses there refers, it means that you will write her poetry, write her poems. Okay, a thousand fragrant poses, you write her poems. You also make her a cup of flowers. So everything that she promises her is drawn from the natural environment. Every item that he promises her is taken from the natural environment. A cup of flowers. Not the city cups that are made with cotton, but this one is, is natural. Okay? It's, it's close to nature. This cup is close to nature, but it's made of flowers. 
full of love. And a kettle embroidered all with leaves of metal. Okay? So all the promises that the shepherd makes the lady, the items are drawn from the natural environment. The next stanza continues to list what he will give her. A gown made of the finest wool. Okay? Shepherds raise sheep. And they take the they take um, wool from the sheep, right? Which from a pretty land we pull, as that they pull the material. This wool is pulled from the from the sheep that they raise, and they call the lambs pretty. Okay, fair lines, um, fair lines slippers for the cold. That means you also make her um, something to wear. Uh, so that our feet will not touch the ground with buckles of purest gold meaning that they the buckles for the slippers will be pure uh, gold still taken from the natural environment but you take gold from the ground then the penultimate stanza continues with listing the items of gifts that he will give a belt of straw and ivy buds the belt will be made of straw, still drawn from the environment, made of ivy buds, a kind of plant, with coral clasps and amber studs. And if these pleasures may be moved, come live with me and be my love. Then we have the final stanza that says, The shepherd's swain shall dance and sing. That means the shepherd's um, um, sheep. Our children will entertain her for thy delight each May morning. That's the only entertainment they will have. If this delight thy mind may move, then come live with me and be my love. So that is quite persuasive, though we don't know what the lady said at the end of the day. It's quite persuasive. We have some, I noticed some. Um, Alliteration in the penultimate line of the last stanza. If this delight thy mind may move, mind may move is alliteration. Then we also have other tropes uh, in the poem. Now, what is noted in this poem is how they Shepherd tries to sweet tongue the lady into, accepted, uh, into accepting to move from the city to the rural area, making promises to her. But the shortcoming of this poem is that we do not know the lady's response. We don't know what she said. Okay? But it is not believed that anybody will be able to refuse such. Um, Enticing offers, which is why this poem has been criticized for excluding the female's voice from its um, narratology. Okay, it's only the man's voice that is heard, and it, we don't like this kind of discourse in gender studies. All right, so perhaps that's the reason why Sir Walter Raleigh wrote the name's reply to the shepherd as a response as a response to to the passionate shepherd to his love because in the name's reply to the shepherd by Sir Walter Raleigh it is only the woman who is speaking it's only the woman who is speaking and she is responding to the to the the words of the shepherd from all indication. She is responding to the shepherd's advancements, advances, love advances from all indications. The, the poem has the same structure as that of Malu. It is written in six stanzas, 
organized in six stanzas, with each stanza having four lines. The same meter, the same rhyme scheme, showing that it's, it's written to match the, the passionate shepherd to his love, making it qualify as a suitable response to the, shepherd, uh, the, to the passionate shepherd to his love. So we can then safely say that there's a dialogic relation between the passionate shepherd to his love and the name's reply to the shepherd. There's a dialogic relation between the passionate shepherd to his love and the name's reply to the shepherd. There's a dialogic relationship. That means that one of the poems is a response to the other. One of the poems anticipates the response of the other. So I'm going to read the names prepared to the shepherd and then go on to explain it. If all the world and love were young and truth in every shepherd's tongue, these pretty pleasures might me move to live with thee and be thy love. Time drives the flock from field to fold, when rivers rage and rocks go gold, and Philomel become the dumb, the rest complains of case to come. The flowers do fade and wanton fields to wayward winter reckoning yields. The honey tongue, a heart of gold, is fancy spring but sorrows fall. Thy gowns, thy shoes, thy beds of roses, thy cap, thy kettle, and thy poses, soon break, soon wither, soon forgotten, in fully ripe, in reason rotten. Thy belt of straw and ivy buds, the coral claps and amber stats, all these in me no means can move to come to thee and be thy love. But could you last and love still breed, at joys no debt, no age, no need. Then these delights my mind may move to, to live with thee and be thy love. Okay, so that is the point. What we notice is that in this point, the lady, which is called the Nims, has refused the love advances of the shepherd, sadly, because she is not impressed by his promises in the first place. <laughs> it is a difficult for a city lady to appreciate the things of the village, no matter the pleasures. Probably since there will be no shopping, right? Since there will be no shopping, you know, shawarma, so. <laughs> okay, so we can also look to the poem to see the reason for this um, rejection of the shepherd's advances. And we see it right from the first stanza. Because you see, this um, lady is deeply philosophical in stating the reasons she has refused the poor shepherd's uh, love advances. She says, if all the world and love were young, and truth in every shepherd's tongue, Okay? That means she would have accepted on the condition that the world is not plagued by unpredictability and change. Okay? Because the passage of time means that people grow older and change in the process or in the course of growing. 
the world grows and then grows old. So the person who is young today will not always be young forever. So change is the constant thing in life. And with this change, people's nature and even love can change as far as it is human love. The subject is susceptible to change. And that is the fear of the lady. If all the world and love were young. And then another reason, philosophical as it is, for her rejection is that it is difficult to know when a man is saying the truth. And that is, and that is seen in the expression and truth in every shepherd's tongue. Men do tell lies yes. in the cause in the cause of courtship. Yes. In the cause of courtship. Alright? In a bit to which is why we noticed that what the shepherd said were mostly he was speaking mostly in hyperbolis. Alright? Saying things that probably he would not be able to do. Alright? Because we know that his primary duty is to take care of the sheep every day. But I promised to the lady that they will always be enjoying, that everything will be enjoyment from the beginning to the end. All right? So you could see that while the shepherd is optimistic, okay, the lady is pessimistic. While the shepherd is ideal in his law propositions, the lady faces reality. That, that probably it is not realistic in life for you to have pleasure all the time. All the time will be pleasure, enjoyment. Like the shepherd has said, every time is enjoyment. We will sit on the rocks, you know, as if they are already in heaven. Okay? So, so the lady is being realistic. Knowing that people, even if the, the shepherd were, was a, to be a good person, it might change in the course of time. Okay? And she's not sure that all these things that he's saying is the truth or are truth. Because at the end of the day, he, he only promised her pleasures. But it's not realistic to expect pleasure in all of one's life because somehow life is also full of pain. So the lady is being realistic at that point. Okay, so she would have accepted him on the condition of um, knowing that every man tells the truth, which is not so, and knowing that people will remain young forever and the world will not change, which is not true. Okay, so if all the world and love were young and truth in every shepherd's tongue, these pretty pleasures might be moved to live with thee and be thy love. Okay, but since that is not possible, she's not going to accept it. And then she goes on to explain her reasons in the second stanza and says, Time drives the flock from field to fold. The shepherd does not stay one place. The shepherd is a nomad. All right, today he is in Obiokwa, the next day he is in Oran, wherever the pasture takes him to. You might hear that the pasture is in Oran, you move the sheep. So, and because his primary concern is ensuring that the sheep don't die. All right? So, by telling the lady that they will always be in a particular place enjoying themselves, when he's not even sure that you will remain in that place the very next morning, time drives the flocks from full, from field to full. All right? Again, talking about the fact that the passage of time brings changes to the individual's life. Okay, and might affect these changes might affect love as well. Because once the shepherd leaves and goes to a far place, far place, it might affect the quality of love. When rivers rage and rocks grow cold, he's, she's talking about changing season. It will not always be summer. Because what the shepherd is describing is summer. When everything is bright and beautiful, all things bright and beautiful, right? <laughs> so it's summer. He has not accounted for winter. When rivers rage and rocks grow cold. Even when you are in a river, 
in the sea and it's calm, it will not always be calm. At the point a storm will arise and there will be problems. So to, to speak only of um, the pleasures is not realistic. All right? One should also speak of the pains that might come, which is why it's always for better and for worse. Okay? But some people, some people always remember the better. When they get to the world, they don't hear. Right? They only hear the better. When is the time for worse? They put cotton in their ears. So they don't hear that word. All right? So it's like they're saying for better and for better. Okay? So when, <laughs> when the worst starts coming, they run away. <laughs> because they didn't hear it. All right? And Salama become the dumb. The rest complains of case to come. So in that stanza, we are exposed to, again, to the unpredictability of the human condition. How change in time can change the individual and can change love. So we move to the third stanza. The flowers do fade and wanton fields to weigh what winter reckoning yields. He has promised her flowers, but she's telling her that flowers don't stay fresh forever. In fact, some flowers after the day, the next day they wither. Okay? So which is likened to the love of man. So, yes, flowers do fade, and I said that that's a metaphor for the for the love of a man, or human love generally. Human, human love generally is, is not perfect because human beings themselves are not perfect. Okay? Man is not even in control of his fate. Alright? So, he cannot speak like the shepherd has spoken as if he has control of time, can predict the future, knows what will happen the next moment. Okay? And the lady is being realistic here. That flowers do fade and wanton fields to where what winter reckoning yields. Meaning that the fields, the rural environment is only beautiful in summer. When winter comes, nobody goes outside during winter except you want to die. Right? You won't see two lovers sitting down in winter where it's very cold and the snow is everywhere. Everybody runs inside the house and, and looks for fire to warm themselves. Okay? So the fields will not be beautiful in winter. It will not be a sight to behold. You cannot even go out. It will be deserted. And then she, in the third line, she says, A horny tongue, a heart of gold. That, what you have there is antithesis. Okay? And that statement is very important to the thematic concern of the poem. A horny um, tongue, which is the tongue of the shepherd. He was saying sweet, sweet things to the lady, but maybe the lady knows that his heart is bitter. All right? <laughs> sweet words, bitter heart. Or sweet words from a bitter heart. <laughs> All right? Okay, so he was whining the lady, right? Yes. Okay? The only tongue, a heart of gold. Okay? People cannot always be um, trusted with their words because they can say whatever they want. They only know their heart. Okay? They only know what is in their heart. A honey tongue, a honey tongue, a heart of God. That's what it means. Like difference, there is a difference between what someone says and what actually is in the person's heart. Because what is in the person's heart, the person will do. All right? And not the sweet words. And that's another aspect of human nature that the lady has to grapple with, or that any lover has to grapple with. All right? It's fancy spring, but sorrows fall. So that again is an antithesis that contrasts the season spring from the season fall. In the fourth stanza, the lady says, Thy gowns, thy shoes, thy beds of roses, 
thy, thy cattle and thy poses soon break, soon wither, soon forgotten. So these are these are these gifts that the that the shepherd promised her are symbols of human love because they don't stand the test of time. Okay? The gifts that the shepherds promised the lady, the cap, the kettle, the poses, they are symbols of human love that cannot stand the test of time because they will soon break, soon wither, and soon forgotten. And then she says, in folly ripe, in reason rotten. Then the penultimate stanza says, Thy belt of straw and ivy buds, the coral claps and amber starts, in these, in me, no means can move to come to thee and be thy love. In that she is not moved by those gifts that the shepherds, the shepherd has promised her. That is where she is firm in her rejection of the shepherd's proposal. Okay? And then in the final stanza, she gives a condition for what could make her accept the love proposal from the shepherd, which is a way of creatively repeating the first stanza of the poem, showing that if um, given these conditions, I could accept, but of course, it's, we know it's not possible. You and I know that this is not possible because it is in human nature. And it says, and she says, but could you last and love still breed? Had joys no date, no age, no need. Then this delight in my mind might move to live with thee and be thy love. You cannot last because the individual will grow old. All right? And love can also grow old with the individual. The love of a young person will not be the same as the love as, as someone who has grown old because then, then, then human beings tend to grow old um, with love. So that is the idea. The change in age can also affect the nature of love. Had joys no dates. Joys has joys have dates in the sense that joys have dates in the sense that no one is happy forever. There are moments of sadness, there are moments of pain, and that is reality. Okay? No age, no need. The tests of the shepherd might change with time as his age changes. So, in the end, the major theme of this poem is the unpredictability of human love arising from the unpredictability of human nature itself and also the uh, link to the unpredictability in nature. All right? Since change is a constant in human affairs, human love is also plagued with changes. That's why somebody wakes up and says, um, they cannot do this anymore, okay? It cannot be done. It is over. It is over. All right? You look over and say it is over. Okay? It's over. I found someone else. That is, I found someone else that is richer, taller, more beautiful. Okay? <laughs> All right? Okay, so that is where we bring our class to an end today.